God, may God be glorified in our time together in the Word. We are in Acts chapter 23. So if you brought your Bible tonight, and we trust that you did, let's turn to Acts chapter 23. We left off last time having finished Acts chapter 22, and we saw that even though Paul had been saved from that angry crowd and the illegal scourging, the day before, he was likely kept for the night inside the fortress for his own protection because there were still a lot of angry and volatile people around. And we mentioned how that the captain made a bit of an unusual move on the following day when he ordered the chief priest to appear and the council, which is the Sanhedrin, the, the, the court there, the Jewish elders, he ordered them to come into session. So he was still apparently seeking answers as to what the underlying disturbance was all about to begin with. So he calls the council to come together and to hear Paul's case. So things are about to get even more interesting because if Paul is pronounced innocent here, he would be released. But if he is found guilty, he would have to go before the Roman government. So the captain released Paul to go and stand before this council to state his case. And it seems like just about every time Paul has an encounter in the book of Acts with people who are, who are trying to stop him or people who are angry with him or coming against his preaching, all they're doing is creating more platforms for Paul to go before some audience of people and to testify the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he always made the most of every opportunity. So there's a lot that we can learn from observing the life of Paul and the Word of God. And if we can make an application of that learning to our own lives, we might see our need to pray, Dear Lord, help us to do the same. Amen? Help us to do the same. May the Lord always give us the grace and strength necessary to take every opportunity and every platform that's provided for us to go and testify of the Lord Jesus Christ. We keep being reminded of this in the book of Acts as we continue to see this repeated as we walk verse by verse through these 28 chapters. So let's begin reading in Acts chapter 23, and I'm going to read the first 11 verses, and then we'll go back and examine those verses more closely. The Bible says here in Paul, Earnestly beholding the counsel, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by to smite him on the mouth. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. For sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law. And they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? Then Paul said, I wish not, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. But when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other part Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. And when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confessed both. And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees' part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or angel hath spoken to him, let us not fight against God. And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Back in verse number 1, it says, And Paul earnestly beholding the council said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. 
When the Bible says here that Paul was earnestly beholding the council, it's telling us that he, he had his eyes fixed on them, or we might say he was gazing upon them. The structure of the word placement in, in the Greek shows that there is an emphasis on this gaze of the Apostle Paul upon the council. So the Word of God thinks enough of this gaze to highlight this gaze. God wants you to understand that. That Paul was gazing upon the council. He was making very clear eye contact with them as he began to speak. And I've met a lot of people in my lifetime that become very annoyed and they become very frustrated when someone doesn't look them in the eye when speaking. Now personally, that's never been one of my pet peeves. I don't get all hung up about it. I, I don't get all bothered about it. But I do suppose that when you have someone trying to speak to you and they're looking off in some other direction constantly, it might be easy to believe that maybe they really weren't all that concerned about the matter or maybe they uh, weren't very convinced or confident of the truth and what they have to say. And uh, these are just my thoughts on the verse. I didn't hear this from another source, but I think it's a good thing that Paul had his gaze fixed upon the council as he began to speak. With the eye contact that was being made, it might have weighed upon these men that, hey, this man Paul, he's very serious about what he's saying here. He's very serious about his testimony of, of Jesus Christ. Here's a man who believes what he's talking about. He believes firmly in the truth of his encounter with the Lord Jesus. Now, had Paul risen to address the council with his head hung low, it probably would have given them the impression that he wasn't convinced of his own words. So we read that Paul tells them, he says, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Now, John MacArthur points out something very interesting. I want to read a quote to you from MacArthur. He said this. He said, Paul began by addressing them surprisingly as brethren. The customary way of addressing the Sanhedrin was rulers and elders of the people as we see that in Acts chapter 4 verse number 8 with the apostle Peter. That's the way Peter begins addressing the council. Uh, or brethren and fathers in Acts chapter 7 and verse number 2 where Stephen was addressing the council. But let me resume this quote. He said, but Paul, unlike Peter and Stephen, had close ties to the Sanhedrin. He undoubtedly knew many of them, probably having once been a member of the Sanhedrin himself. Some may have been students of Gamaliel along with him, and certainly many were fellow Pharisees, and he had surely worked with some of them to eradicate the Christian church. All of this famili familiarity with the Sanhedrin prompted him to address them as equals. So Paul wasn't like Peter. Paul wasn't like Stephen when they addressed the council. Paul was able to address them as equals. Very important to keep in mind. So Paul refers to his conscience twice in the book of Acts. The other reference is going to be in the next chapter, in chapter number 24. And we can also find over 20 instances in the New Testament letters of Paul, if you count Hebrews. And I don't know if Paul wrote Hebrews or not. I know there's been an ongoing discussion about that for many, many years. And I know just about every Bible that I have say, say, says that it's the letter of Paul to Hebrews. I've heard a lot of convincing arguments, uh, a lot of different ways on that. I'm content to say that it was Paul, but I'm not 100% sure that Paul wrote Hebrews. I am 100% sure that it's inspired by the Holy Spirit, and that's what matters. But if you count the epistle to the Hebrews, uh, there's over 20 instances in the letters of Paul uh, where conscience is mentioned. And uh, it was important to Paul that everybody know that his conscience was clear. He had a clear conscience. He's basically telling the council here that he doesn't wish to back down from any decision that he's made up until this point. Paul is saying, I'm not willing to back down from any moral choice that I've made that's <laughs> led me to this point where I'm about to stand trial here today. He's saying, I'm going to stand behind every bit of it. He was going to stand behind everything 
that he had said and done. His conscience was clear, and he's, he's basically telling them, I'm ready for this. Are you ready for it? So Paul had performed his duty as an ambassador of Christ, and as a good citizen of the kingdom of God, he had been confident... And his conscience was clear because Paul knew that he had been doing the will of God. That's why his conscience was clear. Now, in my own life, I can attest, the only times that I've been able to say that I knew for certain that I had done the right thing in a situation is when I had done what it is that God clearly commands for his people to do. Amen. Amen. And that's true for all of us. When you do what God clearly states in His Word that you should do, no matter what it is, whether it's loving your neighbor as yourself, loving those who persecute you, showing compassion to a brother or sister in need, or whatever the case may be, you can be sure you've done the right thing when you do what God says to do. Amen? Your conscience can be clear too, just like Paul's conscience was clear. But if you act in a situation and you can't find your response ordained by God in His Word, then you might end up struggling with doubt as to whether or not you did the right thing in that situation. But when we do the work of God as He has prescribed it, we will know that we did the right thing, and we'll have it settled, and our conscience will be clear. We could be just like Paul, who said, My conscience is clear in this situation. I'm an ambassador of Christ. I've done what it is that God would have me to do as a good citizen of the kingdom of God. Very important. Look at verse number 2. And then the high priest Ananias, and of course it bears mentioning here that I think this is what the third Ananias that we've read about in the book of Acts. They're not the same people. We had Ananias and Sapphira back in Acts chapter 5 who lied to the Holy Ghost. And then we had the Ananias who came and baptized Paul. And uh, this is the high priest Ananias. So Ananias must have been a popular name back then. But uh, this is the high priest Ananias. And the Bible said, Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. For sittest thou to judge me after the law and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law. So no sooner than Paul gets one sentence out of his mouth, they strike him in the mouth. He gets slapped. Now apparently that one sentence is all it took to offend Ananias, the high priest. Now let me share some more info with you about this high priest, Ananias. He became high priest in the year 48 AD and he acted in that position until 59 AD. According to Jewish historian Josephus, uh, Josephus described this high priest, Ananias, as a very greedy man as a profane man, as somebody who was hot-tempered. And uh, this is citing Josephus. I, I reference this from the Life Application Commentary. And his actions were certainly, uh, what Josephus described is consistent with what we see here in the Bible. So he was not overly popular among his fellow Jews. And the reason for that is because he had a lot of pro-Roman sentiment. Ananias had a lot of pro-Roman sentiment. The Jews didn't care for that. There was a lot of tension between the Romans and the Jews. So Paul was quick to address the smiting because he knew this was illegal. And he knew that uh, this command wasn't right. And Ananias had just violated Jewish law by assuming that Paul was guilty before a proper hearing had taken place. And on this assumption, he ordered punishment. But they did the same thing to Jesus. Paul hadn't even been formally charged with a crime here, much less convicted of a crime. And Paul said, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. Now, a whited wall, and uh, sadly, I created the nice little handout, and I forgot the thing and left it at home so I wasn't able to come in here and make copies for you tonight. We're still going to discuss it after the lesson but uh, one of the questions we had on there, and you may want to remember this for later a whited wall is a hypocrite. Paul's basically calling him a hypocrite. A corrupt hypocrite to be more precise. Uh, 
Jesus used similar language back in Matthew chapter 23 uh, when the scribes and Pharisees were there and he, he said, uh, you whited sepulchers. So a whited wall or a whited sepulcher could refer to the practice of whitewashing gravestones. And this is where they took a gravestone and they cleaned it up really nice to where it looked really pretty on the outside, but it represented something that was dead and corrupt on the inside. So Paul spoke out here. He knew that that slap was illegal. It was contrary to the law. He knew that. Look at verse number 4. And they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? Then Paul said, I wist not, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. So Paul is confessing his error here. He didn't know that Ananias was the high priest. And when he was informed of this, he apologized. Not for the sake of the man. I want you to understand this. It's not for the sake of the man, but for the sake of the office of the high priest. A lot of Christians can learn this lesson today. Amen. Amen. If you don't respect the man, at least respect the office. That's what Paul did. Paul was submitting himself humbly to the word of God and even quoted a passage in Exodus chapter 22 and verse number 28 which prohibits speaking evil of a ruler of the people. God's word to him was so important that he sought to abide by it even in terribly difficult, frustrating, and stressful circumstances. Now there has been lots of speculation as to why, before I go any further, let me go back and maybe clarify this. I don't want anybody to be confused. That's not to say, I'm not standing up here trying to tell you that rulers of the people are above criticism when it's warned. We're not saying that. And I don't believe Paul says that. I don't believe the Bible teaches that. But uh, here we have a situation where Paul didn't know this man was the high priest. There's been a lot of speculation as to why he didn't know that. And just to give you a little more background on that and what the possibilities may be, and I've heard for many, many years since I've been saved, uh, some of you remember reading in the Bible where it said that Paul had a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan sent to buffet him, and there's been a lot of speculation on exactly what that was. I've heard everything from osteoporosis to uh, poor eyesight. I don't know about the osteoporosis thing, but a lot of people who have studied history and studied the scriptures, a lot of people seem to believe that Paul struggled with poor vision, poor eyesight for some reason. Be that as it may, I'm not necessarily sure that's the reason that Paul didn't recognize Ananias as the high priest. It could simply be that for the last number of years, Paul's visits to Jerusalem had been so few and so sporadic that maybe he just didn't recognize the man. Maybe he just didn't recognize. He, I believe Paul would have known that somebody named Ananias had that position, but given his sporadic and, and few visits and time spent in Jerusalem, he might not have known him when he seen him. Does that make sense? So that's just my take on the matter. Um, and it's also worth pointing out here that this meeting was called by the captain back in chapter 22. This meeting was not called by the council. The, the Sanhedrin did not convene this meeting in and of themselves. It was called by the captain back in Acts chapter 22. And uh, so maybe, therefore, they were not dressed in their official robes, which would have made it more easy to identify who the high priest was had they been adorned in their official regalia. So we do see something here that we can apply to our lives as Christians. So like Paul, we can honor God in a hostile situation in the midst of hostile people by submission to His Word, by being obedient to His Word. And that's how we'll be effective for the cause of Christ to be submissive to the will of God. The unbeliever... They're not going to be concerned about submitting to the will of God. The rebel against God, 
um, they would have more than likely have just continued to lash out here and just kept it coming. They wouldn't have had respect for the office of the high priest. They wouldn't have had any respect for the word of God. Uh, unbelievers, people who don't know Christ as Savior and Lord, in this situation, uh, they'll often just curse everybody around them. But that's not what Paul did because he knows Christ as, as his Savior and Lord. And the saved child of God, that man or that woman, that boy or girl who has been regenerated by the Holy Spirit, however they respond in a situation like this, however they respond, they're going to respond with consideration to God and God's Word. Now, I'm not saying that the Christian is always going to be perfect, but they will hold the Word of God in high regard, and they will acknowledge God's Word as their rule of faith and practice, and when they fall short of it, if they're truly born again, then we'll have every reason to expect them to repent quickly and to get up and to continue moving forward for the Lord. Verse number 6. But when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other part Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. So we've talked a little bit here about the differences in the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but it's been a while, so just to give us a little review, the Pharisees believed in a bodily resurrection. The Sadducees did not believe in a bodily resurrection because the Sadducees, they only followed Genesis through Deuteronomy which contains no real teaching on resurrection. So when Paul mentioned hope, it really stuck in the heart of this difference between the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and it, and it really took the attention away from Paul and put the focus on this ongoing controversy about the resurrection of the dead. So when Paul identified himself as a Pharisee here, several things happened. It opened the door for Paul to preach about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It gave Paul a bit of support from at least one part of the council, and it prompted the council to get wrapped up again in a debate that just wasn't going to be said. So Paul is utilizing wisdom that was given to him by God. Paul was in trouble because of his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, so God was helping Paul just as God had promised to do. And God will do the same for you. He'll do the same for me. He'll do the same for all of his people who trust him by faith. He'll help you. You don't have to be an intellectual for God to help you. You don't have to be rich for God to help you. You don't have to have some inherent ability to be cool under fire. If you just depend upon God and trust him, God can help you. The God who created the stars and hung them in place is able to give you insight and able to give you wisdom to help you a long life's journey. So as believers mature more and more each day, they rest more and more upon this comforting truth. God will give you the strength to speak up and to share your testimony in any situation where it's God's will for you to do so. God will help you with that. So trust Him. Look at verse 7. And when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. So the Greek word for, for was divided here is schizo. It's the same word we get our English word schism from. So again, this long-standing debate about resurrection and angels and spirits arose once again. You may remember back in Matthew chapter 22 when the Sadducees, they tried to, uh, to trap Jesus in his words. And they used this same, this same scenario with Jesus. Of course, they didn't succeed. But uh, let me read that. Back in Matthew chapter 22, I'm going to Matthew 22 verse 23. Because they, they tried this same thing with Jesus unsuccessfully. 
Matthew 22, 23. The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection, and asked him, saying, Master, Moses said, If a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife deceased and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother, likewise the second also, and the third unto the seventh, and last of all the woman died also. Therefore in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her to wife. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry, nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. Nobody was going to trap Jesus in his words. Nobody was going to catch Jesus in a situation where he was contradicting the truth. That has never happened. It's never going to happen. And this brings me great hope, and it brings me great comfort in my own life to know that my Lord and dear precious Savior, His words are forever settled in heaven, and He will keep every promise that He's ever made. Glory to God. So I guess there has been some discussion as to whether or not Paul intentionally caused this distraction. I don't necessarily believe that he brought up hope just for the reason of causing the distraction, I just believe that he was taking this very precious opportunity to speak the truth, especially before his Pharisee brethren. For all Paul knows, this could very well be the last opportunity to speak the truth to any of them. So he doesn't hold back at any effort to point them to the Savior. So they believed in resurrection and Paul had one in mind to tell them about. Verse number 9 says, And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were the Pharisees part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man. But if a spirit or angel hath spoken to him, let us not fight against God. So now there's another uproar. And we see some of the Pharisees are speaking up in defense of Paul, who had just defended one of their core doctrines by stating the possibility. Uh, well, in doing so, these Pharisees touched on another of their core beliefs by mentioning that perhaps maybe an angel or a spirit had spoken to Paul. But it was, it was the Lord Jesus, that's who spoke to Paul. So some of them might have been present in the last chapter when Paul talked about being in a trance and hearing from Jesus. So the Pharisees would at least be able to associate that trance with the possibility that maybe Paul had heard from an angel or a spirit, but the Sadducees... They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in spirits. So they would have completely just rejected the whole thing outright. And they would have said, well, it's just impossible. It couldn't have happened. Verse number 10. And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. So this dispute here between the Pharisees and the Sadducees in the council has now become so inflamed and so heated that the captain had to remove Paul again for his own safety. He had to step in and order soldiers to come and take Paul away. So once again, we see Paul almost ripped to shreds by a crowd of angry Jews and yet it's the Gentiles stepping in to show him kindness. He was taken and locked in Roman barracks to guard him against the Jews who wanted to kill him. Verse number 11. In the night following, 
the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul. I love this. This is the Lord. Jesus has come. Jesus has come to encourage Paul. Be of good cheer, Paul. For as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. This wasn't just a case of Jesus appearing out of nowhere after a long absence. No, he'd always been with Paul. He'd been with Paul every step of the way, just like he's with you every step of the way if you're saved. Just like he's with me every step of the way. But the Lord knew that Paul needed some added comfort and added encouragement on this particular night. And this is, this is a truly wonderful encounter here with Jesus in verse number 11. Look at what Jesus said to Paul. He said, Paul, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. But then he goes on and he explains why Paul should be of good cheer. He acknowledged Paul's faithfulness in saying, Thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem. So he acknowledged Paul's faithfulness and then he gives Paul a promise. He said, You've testified of me in Jerusalem, Paul. So must thou bear witness also at Rome. This is Jesus promising Paul that he's going to get out of this current mess safely. Jesus has somewhere else for Paul to go. He wasn't going to die just yet. And I'd be willing to say that after this encounter with the Lord, Paul probably rolled over and slept like a baby. So let me close with these two applications. First, Paul was living his life as an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. And part of what it means to live your life as an effective ambassador of Christ is seen in Paul's example of just simply keeping your conscience clear. Right? Keep a clear conscience. Paul kept his conscience clear by submitting himself to the will of God and the Word of God. And we too should keep our conscience clear by doing the same. If our consciences are not clear as a result of submitting to the will of God, then we'll never have a basis to rebuke any evil or wrongdoing we see anywhere in this world, whether it's in our home or family or out here in society. If your conscience is not clear because you've not submitted to the will of God, you have no foundation to speak against any of that. But if our consciences are clear as a result of submitting our lives to the Lord, then we can say what needs to be said. We can do what needs to be done and not have to worry about being guilty of the very things that we're speaking out against. Secondly, remain willing and ready at all times to tell the story of Jesus. God keeps driving this home in the book of Acts because he's just that serious about it. Paul had a connection to the Pharisees and he used that connection to promote the gospel. Who are you connected to? Now, it's not a prerequisite that you be connected in a particular way to someone in order to share the gospel. You can share the gospel with anybody. It's the power of God and the salvation. But sometimes your connection can give you a platform that maybe you wouldn't have otherwise. And we need to take advantage of these opportunities whenever they arise. And that's just a basic characteristic of a person who's saved by the grace of God. And tonight, my prayer is, may God give us all the grace and strength uh, to be this type of Christian. And now, even though we don't have the handout tonight, because Pastor Vern forgot to print a copy and bring it to church, I want to go over this on the PowerPoint nonetheless. And uh, the way I've got the PowerPoint set up is, is uh, well, I could do it like this. Now, I know you didn't get to fill this in on your handout, but we'll go over it. Maybe we can talk about some of this. The first one said, when the Bible says, when the Bible says that Paul was earnestly be beholding the council, it means that he was, A, frantically grabbing people, B, waving his hands to get their attention, C, gazing upon them with clear eye contact, or D, ignoring everyone. C. C, very good. Hey, y'all are going to do better, better at this than I've taught. 
not having the hand out. Okay, C, gazing upon them with clear eye contact. Number two, Paul's familiarity with the council, which was the Sanhedrin, prompted him to address them as, anybody remember? That was the word that, he, yes, that was the word in the scripture. The word I'm looking for on the handout was equals. So you're not wrong, but they were, yeah, brethren. But he was addressing them as equals. Are you jealous of Richie getting that right? Yeah. I suspect <laughs> she was. Okay. Uh, number three, there are, are over blank instances in the New Testament letters that, if we count Hebrews where Paul speaks of conscience. Does anybody remember that? Yes, sir. 20. Over 20. Wow. Okay. Hang in there. Number four, Paul's conscience was clear because he knew that he had been doing the will of God. True. True or false? True. Good job. Number five, and this is a fill in the blank. The high priest Ananias was not very popular with his fellow Jews because he had a pro-blank sentiment. Anybody remember that? Pro-Roman sentiment. Any questions or comments about any of this up till now? All right, number six, the command from Ananias to Paul to be, let me re I'm stuttering a lot tonight, bear with me. The command from Ananias for Paul to be struck on the mouth was totally legal, true or false? False. That is false, it was illegal. And uh, I, I have a scripture reference for that, and I don't have it in front of me. I think it's from the book of Deuteronomy that uh, points out exactly why that was illegal. If I could find that later on, maybe I'll, I'll send it to you. Um, number seven, fill in the blank. When Paul referred to Ananias as a white at wall, he was calling him a hypocrite. hypocrite. Yes, indeed. That's exactly what he was. Number eight, this is true or false. Paul had respect for the office of high priest. True. That was true. And uh, unfortunately, I really regret that we don't have the uh, handout for number nine because I had asked you to circle or underline all that apply to Pharisees. And we'll just go ahead and give you the answer here. The answers are in the red. So the Pharisees believed in the resurrection. The Pharisees believed in angels and spirits. And uh, I didn't touch heavily on that future heavenly reality. Uh, but uh, you could, I guess you could put together that if the Sadducees didn't believe in angels and spirits, then they're probably not going to believe in a future heavenly reality if that's the case. So basically everything that's no goes to the Sadducees. Any questions? Yes. That scripture that you read over in Matthew in regards to talking about angels and spirits, do you think that's where a lot of people get that when someone passes away that they become an angel? The, the scripture in Matthew 22 about the, the, husbands and the husbands yeah, and the husbands and the wives. Yeah, where that they become as angels of heaven. Did it say that? Let me go back and look. Verse 30. 22 30. Well, I mean, I guess someone could possibly 
come away with that. I personally never have. I mean, I, I remember reading that verse as a, as a new convert, and I, it never struck me as, well, I'm going to become an angel when I die. But, uh, you know, I, I think that he's referring to, in a sense, that they'll be as the angels of heaven, in the sense that they're neither married nor given in marriage. That's the way it strikes me. Uh, that's how they're like the angels. Is there's no, there's no going to be, you know, you're not going to be. Married or given in marriage. But, uh, you know, who knows? I mean, anybody could read a verse of scripture and misinterpret it if they're not rightly dividing the word and looking at the context. So to answer your question, have there been people who read that verse and Maybe come away thinking that? Sure, probably. I don't think that's the context of it, though. Okay. Anything else? Any other questions about that? Did I answer that satisfactorily? Yes, sir. Just to, just to, you know, to sort of underline that. I, I, I do believe that when you read this with the context in mind of what's going on here, He's talking about, you know, on earth this, uh, this woman had all seven of these men as her husband and then she died. And then they get to heaven and they're, they're not in marriage nor given in marriage. That's how they're like the angels. In that sense. Alright. Any other questions? Alright, if you'll come and get a song. We'll conclude our service tonight. God bless you all. Thank you once again for your good attention. Thank you for your prayers. If anybody stands in need of prayer tonight, for 